Okay, so now we're going to go on to our next segment. You heard from Dr. Sharon Hoover Stephen about national best practices. We heard about some amazing resources. We heard about the importance of implementation and really being meaningful about taking a program from inception to outcomes and really having a dialogue between these two systems, this tale of two systems, as she said, you know, between the schools and mental health and how do we make sure that they work well together. But it sounds great in theory, right? And of course, Sharon has implemented in dozens of schools in Maryland. And now here's some best practices we have in the state of Nebraska for you to hear about. And we're gonna have each one of them speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we're gonna have Dr. Sharon Hoover Stephen give a couple brief comments and we'll open it up to questions. And as you're listening, I would, I would love to have each table think of at least one good question that you would ask, you know, based on how are you gonna roll this out at your program, at your school, and, and what, what are some practical implementation questions? So uh, without further ado, let me in introduce our three speakers on Nebraska school mental health practices. Uh, Victor Sherman is program manager at Methodist Community Counseling Program, and he is an MS and LMHP. Um, Darius Mettler is Special Education Director for Educational Service Unit 7. And Amy Nelson is a community volunteer extraordinaire uh, and also represents the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention Nebraska chapter. And she's going to talk about the new training uh, in schools about suicide prevention. So please help me welcome them. And we'll have uh, Victor start off with the first set of slides. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Dr. Luke. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I've been asked to speak uh, briefly this morning about Methodist Hospital's Community Counseling Program. Um, I'm going to be talking about three main components, I guess, if you will. Uh, basically, about our origins, and then also about how we have evolved through the years in OPS and also in the community. And then also um, just provide a few of our service numbers over this past school year. Uh, so it's going to be a very brief uh, overview of our program. We began, our journey began really in 1990. Um, we had an OPS school board, uh, our school personnel, uh, for those of you who might know them, it was the, uh, the uh, superintendent, or the, the supervisor of the guidance and counseling program at that time, Stan Malachewski. He approached uh, our, our foundation and uh, he requested help to, to provide behavioral mental health counseling um, services to the students. And they also, at the same time, they had pastors in the community that were saying uh, they saw the need to provide mental health services um, to some of their parishioners. And so some area pastors were also coming to the foundation at that time as well. And so um, we had the school coming to the foundation and also area pastors. And so uh, the foundation began to dialogue with the pastors in this community and the schools as well. Uh, so between 1990 and 1995, uh, we had a collaborative effort or collaborative plan was created with the foundation, OPS superintendent, OPS school board, pastors, uh, church board, at that time Methodist Richard Young. Um, and then the program was to provide professional counseling services at no charge to the youth and others with the least access to behavioral mental health in the Omaha community. What they did, the foundation at that time had an endowed fund. That was the core um, funding program, or f core funding of this program. Uh, they had a uh, fund that was established through the 1980s, and it was set aside for substance and substance use, uh, substance abuse, and mental health. And so it was set aside for that purpose only. And uh, so this fit really well within uh, that um, that use. Our goal at that time, and, and still is, is to bring professional counseling services closer to children and families and to ensure that uh, those services are available to everyone regardless of their ability to pay. We have five main objectives. And the first is to provide a uh, community uh, counseling outreach program to low access areas. And number two is to offer services as close as possible to define target populations. Um, our services, um, we record three main th services, our service types or encounters, I guess, if you will. 
um, counseling therapy services. We have professional consultations uh, and then um, professional presentations or education classes. So in our, our work, those are the three main areas that we have encounters, I guess, if you will, with, with clients. So those are the services. So our services, when you see services and the numbers that I report, let, report later, it'll be in those three type of areas. Our third objective was to provide early intervention services to prevent mental behavioral health problems. Uh, we work to stabilize family and school crisis situations. And then the fifth is to provide triage and referral services for individuals uh, in need of different level of care. So from day one, it's to, to get in and to assess and to refer to community resources. We were really active in getting uh, them plugged into other services as needed. Um, so from uh, that collaborative effort, so it took five years to work with the legal issues and everything to get all the, the details worked out. So in 1995, we had our launch year. Uh, our program model provided a licensed mental health uh, therapist practitioner part-time in both an OPS high school and a nearby church office location. Um, for those of you familiar with the area, we started at Benson High School and St. Paul United Methodist Church. Um, Dr. Alva Clark was uh, the... Um, he was a longtime pastor in the community and also ended up working at uh, the foundation. And so he was a pastor at uh, St. Paul United Methodist Church. Uh, so I don't know if that was the uh, impetus behind those locations, but I, it was also in collaboration with OPS and why we, uh, that was selected as well. Uh, he had a passion for mental health and serving the community. And he, my time with him, he was always passionate about being where the, the people were. And one of the, the lines that he always told me through the years was, I want to be where they live, learn, and worship. And he says, I, I want to break down the barriers to mental health. And his main, again, he, his main thing to me all the time was, I want to be where they are. I want to be where they live, learn, and worship. And uh, so uh, Benson High was our, our first uh, high school that we um, provided services in. Um, after the successful pilot year and first year at Benson High School, um, we, over the next three years, we expanded it to three other high schools and nearby locations. We, um, well, we expanded actually into um, Burke High School, um, North High School, and then South High School. And then over in, in 1998 and 99, OPS requested assistance from Methodist Hospital Foundation at that time to expand into 12 elementary schools, which, which we did as well with those, again, with those endowed funds that they had set aside for the substance abuse and mental health services. So that's why, that's when I came into the program to provide services in the elementary schools. And in 2000, 2003, with a generous contribution from a local charitable found, uh, foundation, and at the request of um, community, or at the LPS, the community counseling program began phasing into the middle schools. So OPS at that time was able then to provide counseling services in their elementary schools. We began phasing out of the elementary schools and had uh, started phasing into the middle schools. And so in 2003, that process began. And then for the next six years, we, we were in uh, three uh, middle schools and then those high schools. So the way that our program is now from 2009 to, 2000, or to the present, um, we had another substantial contribution from an area family uh, foundation. The community, ca community counseling program was able to double in our size. So we went from eight to 16 um, counselors and therapists. We doubled in size, allowing the program to add the counseling services to all the OPS middle schools and all the high schools. And then 11 community locations. Our community partners, we were talking earlier about it's important to bring in community partners. Um, we have uh, Methodist Hospital Foundation, Methodist Hospital, Best Care Employee Assistance Program. That's where we're based out of. Um, Richard Young closed in April of 2003. Um, we were a break-even program, so they just needed a place to house us. We were housed with over, over with Best Care EAP. Uh, area, area Family Charitable Foundations. Omaha Public Schools, and then participating churches. Churches allow us to use their space during the week. They have the space. We're able to use their, their locations. So it's a great partnership with the area churches. Community counseling program has served the behavioral mental health needs of the metro area for over 20 years. 
since our pilot year of 1995. Uh, we really have eliminated the, the barrier of cost to all and eliminated the issue of accessibility for many. And the reason I say that is because when we're in the school, we work only with those students and those families in that school. When we're in our community location, we are able to provide services to the entire metro community, uh, to all the districts, to all um, ages of children, from elementary to geriatric, I mean, to everybody. And so, um, so the other districts are able to access our community locations, those who um, have a higher deductible, those who don't have insurance, uh, from a variety of different reasons why uh, they're not able to access mental health services. Um, so due to the incredible uh, financial donations by many, uh, the community counseling uh, program currently employs 16 full-time year-round mental health counselors. We have a variety of credentials uh, and training. Uh, we have LIMHPs, LMH, LMHPs. We have um, um, drug alcohol counselors. We have uh, licensed uh, social workers, marriage and family therapists. We have professional counselors. We have a board uh, certified art therapist. We have two supervisors, a program manager. So we have a wide variety of clinical training, expert, uh, expertise that we bring to the team to work together to provide the services to the community. Um, we have 32 offices throughout the city of Omaha. Uh, we have one main office, 11 community offices. Office. We have eight OPS high schools and we're in 12 middle schools. Um, our program support services are provided by Methodist Hospital, um, found, or Methodist Health Systems, and then uh, Best Care EAP. Our, the Best Care EAP provides uh, wonderful office support for us. And um, the health system in kind they um, provide our HT, um, or HD, IT and HR services. It's all uh, in-kind service so to, to allow us to, to do the services that we do. This past school year, I'll run through a quick, uh, some quick numbers for you. This past school year, August to May, we pr uh, provided 9,500 uh, behavioral mental health counseling sessions that broke down to about 6,300 school sessions, I guess, if you will. Um, and then 32 community office sessions. It's that same time period, consultations, again, like I said, those services that we do, those three main areas, we provided 5,300 consultations, and that's, again, from a systems perspective, I bring in anybody and everybody I can to help, you know, bring about change, make things better today than they were yesterday for that student. And so, um, again, we talk about the support, uh, student support liaison, school resource officers, anybody and everybody that can bring change. So those are what we call professional consultations. Um, and then uh, on average, we make about uh, 30 plus uh, referrals to community resources per month to uh, anybody, uh, those students who need specialized care. And that would be for like addiction, self-help, nurse practitioners, psychiatrists, uh, general practice, medical, legal, school-based health centers. We're in three schools that have school-based health centers. We refer to them and their resources. Uh, the presentation is this is a 2014. This is a calendar year because it concludes or includes our summer program. We have a summer program of educational classes because uh, that's a big part of the prevention. We I believe in the prevention part. And so we, in our community locations and some of our other partner programs, we do a lot of education classes, and so um, we do a lot of uh, uh, just parenting classes and anything to do with education. So we provided 193 professional presentation education classes last year, and uh, over 4,000 participants of those classes. So in summary, the community counseling program is a, an established charitable program. Behavioral mental health counseling that's helped addresses the need of mental health uh, care children and youth in Omaha community. Um, and so I flew that through that real quick. There's my contact information. If you want to have any questions, if you want to send me an email, feel free to do that. And uh, thank you for your time. Good morning. I hope to get to where you are. <laughs> we are a pilot, have just started this school year. Amy Holmes has helped us from Beacon to get this pilot going. I was invited, I'm new to ESU 7, I'm the special ed director there. I'm new and I was invited to this meeting of about 18 people and we sat and talked for a while and 
All of a sudden she said, who wants to run this program and be the pilot? And for about two minutes it was quiet and I couldn't take it anymore and I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so we became the pilot and we are extremely excited that we're the pilot and it has been going very well. So I'm here to share information about it. It is LB556, our legislatures, legislators have gotten together and decided that funding is needed to train our teachers in behavioral health. Um, number one, I'd love everybody to clap, funding is available. <laughs> Great for us. Um, we have looked and looked to bring the two together and it hasn't happened. I was a SPED director at ESU 8 for eight years and we tried and it didn't work for the school districts and it was a fund issue, it didn't work for the providers. Now that the funding's there, for whatever reason, you send out a survey, hundreds of responses and we're all ready to go. So it's pretty exciting. Um, if, I, get a, I guess I get a click. And I think if you could click this link, this is how I felt when I knew we were gonna be able to bring everybody together. So, all excited. <laughs> Hasn't seen his partner for two years and will actually pass out, as I did when I took this on. <laughs> Here he goes. Oh. <laughs> All right, we can go ahead and move on. The dog was fine and its owner is fine also. But yes, very excited. Oh, here we go. We'll get back to the PowerPoint so we can go to the next slide. We pretty much have monthly meetings and discuss the things that we're doing. Um, ESU 7 has 17 districts that I work with. Norfolk Public is also working with us and Columbus Public. And ESU 8 has become involved now also. So it is a very large group of people working together. Uh, we put a survey together, sent it out, and as I told you again, the survey came back very quickly from a number of our participants. Here are the participants that we have. Um, we didn't send out to classroom teachers because we would have gotten six, 7,000 responses and we wouldn't know what to do with them. <laughs> so we started with staff of principals, counselors, special ed teachers, teachers, and then nurses also were in the other group. You can see the number of respondents we had, which was a very good response. Um, in the survey, we asked them to identify themselves, obviously, and then what skill sets they think their teachers need what specific programs they may be using at this time, how should we deliver services to you once we get to that point, and then if they have used any behavioral health providers in the past, if they would identify them and give us contact information. And that was a key point for us because obviously there are so many providers out there, where do you start and begin? So I got an incredible list of 29, 29 behavioral health providers. So we use that and set up a, a Google Doc and I'll show you that in a second. But it was a great way for us to get started in being able to find the people we were gonna work with. Here, is just some of, here are some of the comments that came back from people, just general, they could put other in there and I'll just kind of let you read them. In blue is the stuff that I think is just really important. We want contact with therapists, remain empathetic. I, I think that's probably the biggest part in my story and my real involvement with this is that as a special ed teacher, sometimes students will be in special ed and have behavioral health concerns. Other students aren't in special ed, but I still get involved through 504 plans and things. So we had a girl that, um, was struggling both with eating disorders and depression. And she was about six foot tall and 68 pounds and struggling and not being able to sleep at night, not being able to make it to school. Well, the school district had a policy that in order to participate in the school play, you needed to be at school. Well, she couldn't be at school, so the only thing that was left for her to do was to be in a school play that she wanted to do, but she wasn't able to participate for those reasons. So we got involved through a 504 plan, and then I really found out how teachers and administrators and everybody were feeling. And she was a brilliant girl, straight A's, but because she was brilliant, she shouldn't be acting like this. Um, she's making the decision not to participate, so she will have to be disciplined or punished. So we worked with them, worked with them, um, actually got them to start taping classes, send it to her home, because she could do it from home. She, you know, 
and decided, yeah, the play was worth it. So she got to be in the play, the one thing that was left in her life. So this is where I think that LB556 is going to do so much for our classroom teachers and our administrators to understand what the behavioral health issues are. Um, and even if a student is smart academically, it doesn't mean that they might not struggle. Okay? I'll go on. The second one is from a counselor. I thought it was just great the way she had put it, and you can take a look at it, but I think the last line when you read that is the most telling, and I think it's a group of people that we haven't paid enough attention to, but I think it's pretty incredible. And I'd just like to say, I, I, being in school districts all to this point, I love our psychologists, I love our nurses, I love our counselors, but now I'm really starting to love these mental health people. <laughs> Everybody that I talk to has best, just been so incredible, and I think it's going to be an incredible partnership for us in the future. Um, in our survey, what we sent out was just a list of the different areas that they wanted to learn about or have training on. Uh, so each participant just responded to it, and as you can see, many of them are above 50%, and that made us start thinking, oh, those are the trainings we have to do, and then when I thought about it more, it's really about if there's something that's 1% on there, it needs to be trained, because there's one student out there that's having that issue. So we are hoping to provide all of this stuff, and, and that's our plan with all the providers. We've got a list of 17 now. They've told us all of the skills that they have, and we're doing it from ESU 7. The district will call us, tell us what they want, and then we'll go down the list and find those providers. And we've got multiple providers in all the different areas that hopefully we'll be able to hook them up and do it throughout for all districts. Um, probably our two most exciting pieces on this piece of the survey was down at the bottom we had empathy and un unmet needs for the students, and that was at 53 and 49 percent. And I think that's really telling, and obviously this is a group of special ed people that have done a lot of this type of work already, but for them to see that that's really a big piece of the training that we need is for people to understand, be compassionate, and be able to move forward with the students. Uh, we got all the survey results back, and then we wanted to put together a presentation. So on March 2nd was our first presentation. Um, and once again, it is truly a marathon and not a sprint, <laughs> because in the beginning we thought, oh, this is in October, and we thought we'd be ready in November, and then it was December, then it was January, <laughs> February. We were ready in March. Um, we had Dr. Kate Hazeldine and Dr. Katie Metasek, and Katie Metasek actually comes and does some work in Columbus, where our unit is. She works with Monroe Meyer. Um, Kate Haz Hazeldine is out west. And they came and provided about two and a half hours of training on different things that it was a great workshop because they came with what they wanted to do, but they asked our participants what they wanted. So they completely switched their schedule and taught the group what they wanted. They taught for about two and a half hours, and then I brought our providers. We were able to actually get 10 on that date, but we brought our providers in, put them throughout the room in the corners of the room. When they were done speaking, all of our staff from our school districts were able to speed date with them. <laughs> so they went around and around, <laughs> asked questions, and met their providers. And, and probably, overwhelmingly, that was what our staff liked, is, oh, these are the people that will come out and talk to us. So, so we had that connection of 10 of our providers. We hope to do that again at the beginning of the school year, just to be able to meet your providers so you know who, who can come out and assist you in the program. And then the last thing, just to show you real quickly, is just the Google Doc that we put together. And if you could click that, and not real high tech, people are helping me learn all this stuff. <laughs> but basically, we used the Google Doc in the start to be able to contact our providers. And once, oh shoot. <laughs> Shoot again, yeah. <laughs> um, I can just explain it to you. Um, what we did was had the, the business is to start, then we had the contact, then we had the areas of expertise, then we had if they were willing to travel to our districts. We have districts that are 50 miles away from Columbus, and many of the providers are right in Columbus, and then if you're willing to train school districts. And then we made the link clickable to their business. So this will go out to all the school districts, and they can just click the link. It'll take them to their business, and they can learn more about the provider. So that's the way we set it up and have gotten it started. Our hopes are now this 
school districts through the summer are making decisions on what type of trainings they want for the upcoming school year. We have left it wide open to the school district and the provider, and our providers have been very open to doing it at whatever time the district wants. Um, districts will have certain days, we'll provide those days, and once again, just having that capacity of many, many providers, we have the option of going down the list. If this provider can't do it on February 14th at two o'clock, <laughs> we'll move down to the next provider. So we took it very slow in the beginning because I didn't want to do a workshop where they would get excited about it and we then wouldn't be able to present. <laughs> my thoughts were, oh my gosh, then what right after the meeting if they're calling and saying, well, we want this and this and this. So that's why our process really took the whole year. I think it was very good for us as a team to look at that and go in that direction. And we just plan to move forward and actually get the providers into the district this next school year. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time today. My name is Amy Nelson. I volunteer with the Nebraska chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. Um, who we are is uh, one of the leading nonprofit organizations dedicated to understanding and present, preventing suicide through research, education, and advocacy. Um, for our chapter, I serve as a field advocate, board member, co-chair of our program services, and chair of our public policy committee. So like many of our other volunteers who is surfing the internet at all odd hours, looking for answers, um, I was introduced to AFSP underneath um, unfortunate circumstances. My younger sister, Amanda, died by suicide when she was 16 in September of 1995. And it wasn't until several years later that my mom uh, began her volunteer work with AFSP, and she introduced me to them. So here I am, advocating for suicide prevention. And I feel fortunate to be here today and to have the opportunity to share a bit with you about what advocating for suicide prevention looks like in our schools. Now, although part of our conversation today involves LB 923, which is new legislation in Nebraska that will require one hour of annual training for all of our teachers and school personnel in suicide awareness and prevention training, that doesn't necessarily mean that advocacy can only be attained through legislative means. There's other things we can be doing in our schools to advocate suicide prevention, such as sharing the message that suicide is preventable, sharing PSAs, working to eliminate that stigma that surrounds mental illness and the act of suicide or suicidal attempts, um, making sure that we have a plan or a policy in place that addresses these issues and continuing that conversation about suicide prevention. Now, of course, supporting suicide prevention um, through legislative efforts is important as well. And right now on the federal level, we have a lot going on with research as well as competitive grants that would allow school districts the ability to have that in-house mental health professional. So if these are important issues to you, I urge you to contact your congressmen, contact your senators, let them know how important this is to you. Um, in preparing for this, I've been struggling in what order do I want to give you the background on LB 923? Um, I don't want to be too wordy. I don't want to get too much into statistics. Because when we're talking about youth suicide, we're really talking about young lives, or sadly, the lack thereof. Um, so when Amanda died, we knew her death had drastically affected our family and those very close to us, her friends, her friends' families, but we didn't realize the impact it had on her teachers. In fact, it wasn't until I was in my 30s that we realized one of her teachers still visited her grave site. Now, this isn't to say we didn't recognize there was an important relationship between Amanda and her teachers, just that there was a, a disconnect on the part of our family until we had youth back into that school system. So the teacher shared with my mom that he was still bothered. He was bothered that he didn't see it coming. What, what did he miss? How could he have helped her? Well, we had often asked the same thing of ourselves, and sometimes we still do. Suicide has a ripple effect that touches so many and for such a long time. Good news is that suicide is preventable. Most people who kill themselves show one or more warning signs leading up to their death. But sadly, in my sister's situation, uh, neither our family, her teachers, we really didn't recognize the, the, the subtle warning signs she was giving, the severity of how much she was struggling. The other promising news, and I'm gonna read this because it's such a mouthful and I don't wanna mess it up. The promising news is that research shows that individuals who are trained to recognize and respond to suicide risk feel more knowledgeable about suicide, more competent in approaching an at-risk student, 
and more confident in their ability to ask directly about suicidal thoughts, to be persuasive about getting help, and to be able to provide an appropriate referral, all increasing a chance that a young life may be saved. So in fall of 2013, we began a collaborative effort with the Nebraska State Suicide Prevention Co uh, Coalition to um, help save lives by creating legislation that would require this type of training, evidence-based best pra practices registry training, be brought to Nebraska's teachers and all school personnel. Senator McGill introduced LB 923 in, oh goodness, I think it was fall of 2013, and by April 2014, the bill had passed with a vote of 45 to zero. At the time we were working on this legislation, 18 other states had some similar legislation in place. Today, that number is 24. So we can see as a nation that we're really starting to recognize schools play such a vital role in preventing suicide in our youth. Um, we really feel that educators and school personnel are invaluable. Nine months or more out of the year, eight, 12, or more hours out of the day is spent with our children. And they're not just teaching them and coaching them, but they're building really important relationships with them. Our schools are just really on the front lines. Um, I do wanna share some of the, uh, just a bit of the relevant statistics we had while we were working on this effort. Um, at the time, 2010 CDC was the most current information we had. And it showed that in Nebraska, suicide was a third leading cause of Nebraska's children ages 10 to 19. And according to the 2013 Kids Count in Nebraska report, one in seven Nebraska students surveyed had seriously considered suicide, and one in 10 of those children had a plan. Another national study that was conducted by the Jason Foundation indicated that the number one person that a student would turn to for help if they felt their friend was suicidal was a teacher. Our teacher's rules are so important. So our hope is that the requirements of LB 923 are just part of the larger conversation in schools about suicide prevention. Our hope is that it sparks a sincere interest in finding out about more ways in which we can reach out to our at-risk students. For example, checking out additional training on the Breast Practices Registry, taking a look at what the schools and the school districts have available for resources, um, one example I'm familiar with is the school where my children attend. They're able to offer two free sessions at an Omaha uh, counseling group for every student in the district if the need should arise. Another important piece that I want to make sure I cover that is so important is that the school districts really take a look at their policy regarding suicide prevention and the protocol for after a suicide early on. And if direction is needed, there are some excellent models available. And these models cover prevention, intervention, postvention, safe messaging. Many of them will cover what the state guidelines are, parental involvement, um, what to do if there's an attempt on the school site, what to do if there's an attempt off school site. And so importantly, how do we integrate that student back into the school environment afterwards? So just a lot of important ways that we can advocate within our schools. Um, again, I want to thank you for all that you guys are doing. Thank you for allowing me to share with you, um, and I hope you feel comfortable asking any questions. Okay, so thank you so much to our panelists. I just feel privileged that I was able to hear all of those remarks, and Howard has asked me to just take a minute or two to respond. Um, so I jotted down a few notes as I was listening in, uh, not only kind of for me to take back, but also just to reflect with all of you on, on the different stories that we heard today. So I'll just kind of go in sequence through what I heard and pull out a couple of the themes uh, that were intriguing or inspiring for me. So first from Victor, you know, I, I was intrigued as you kind of went through the five goals of your services because I think it's so aligned with how we think about school behavioral health and the value of what we do. You talked about for low access children, right? So those who are underserved, providing services that are close by, so as near as possible to our youth and families so that they can actually get to services because we know barriers exist. You talked about early intervention. The earlier we can reach our young people, the better. I saw some fantastic work over in the exhibitors tables for our really young children, ages two to eight. One of the programs was, was targeting, so that was compelling to me, talking about early intervention, stabilizing families in crisis, and then triaging and 
referring, and in all of this, the role of schools in doing so. One of the things that I found particularly um, hopeful about your remarks, Victor, was just how well your effort has actually used community resources. So just as a tangible example, working with your church community to actually have them offer space during the school day or during the school week as a venue for providing behavioral health services. We really do need to have multiple partners around the table, whether it's our faith community, our business leaders, uh, other behavioral health providers, providers and health providers. So I was just pleased and, and uh, inspired again by how well you've actually brought community partners to the table. I'm of course intrigued by the funding model that you've used and last night as we talked about uh, this particular effort for, for your organization to be able to come to the schools and say what we offer has been gifted to the school system is really powerful uh, because it takes away some of the barriers that uh, do get in the way sometimes with health systems or behavioral health systems. So I would just say keep up the good work. One of the things that I would encourage as far as outcomes monitoring, the numbers were truly uh, you know, overwhelming in terms of the number of services that you had delivered, the number of children that you had seen and what I would hope to see next time is kind of what is, and this is what's hard for us to collect, but what is the impact on things like academic outcomes or did, were we able to impact their psychosocial indicators? Were they able to get better functionally? That, that can be really difficult to collect, but very compelling for funders. So I would hope to see that. Um, Darius, am I saying your name correctly? Okay, so so you were very brave to take on this new initiative, uh, and and I'm glad that you did because it seems like uh, you've done some really good work. I was. Uh, very intrigued by the idea of, as you called it, speed dating to kind of really open the conversation of mental health. This is a great example of how we can utilize our behavioral health providers just to open the dialogue with our school community. Training teachers is one of the most important things we can do, and Amy really kind of reflected upon that. But just at a broad level, kind of just opening the dialogue with tabletop discussions, having your behavioral health providers come in and talk about topics that may be of interest to your teaching community is absolutely critical. So I was excited about the idea of, of kind of having venues for doing that, having opportunities for doing that, uh, because ultimately, and I just wrote down the word relationships, because this work truly is about just forming relationships, and if you can provide a venue for doing that or an opportunity for doing that, it can really allow our educators uh, to kind of decrease some of the stigma and really see things through a new lens. That's how I, I saw you kind of talking about uh, that, that they then started viewing children's behavior even through a new lens, a mental health lens or a support lens, moving away, for example, from a disciplinary response to more of a supportive response, which is critical for so many of our children. So thank you, and keep up your, your brave work. And, and then Amy, I want to thank you for sharing your personal story uh, and your family's story, and also just kind of reflecting on the idea that really all of us in some way are touched by someone uh, experiencing psychological distress or mental illness. Every one of us in the room has a story around mental health, mental illness, psychological distress. And so do our legislators and our policymakers. And I think Amy has just done an outstanding job of demonstrating how reaching out to our legislators, to our decision makers, and bringing these stories that are so, um, that resonate with all of us in many ways can move to action. So we're all moved to action at an individual level, but we also need to take that next step. I love how you encourage people to contact their representatives, their senators, and the action here was relatively swift in terms of actually taking this legislation uh, and moving it to something actionable. The fact that you have one hour now that all of your school personnel, is it, have to actually take uh, some type of uh, suicide prevention training or learn more about how to uh, identify and refer students who are experiencing psychological distress is fantastic. Um, so I'm really excited for that opportunity. I also, though, um, was struck by how you said it can't just be about legislative action, that there are so many other things we can be doing, whether it's PSAs or working with our school counseling community developing plans and policies, looking at the grants that are out there. So I just want to thank you again for kind of moving us to action, both at the legislative level, but also thinking about what we 
can we do in each school building to create change? So thanks to all of you. Inspiring work. Uh, I learned a lot as I was listening in, and it just speaks to some of the great things that are happening here in Nebraska. Thank you. Well, my thanks as well to Dr. Stephen for some really outstanding, insightful comments. And, and I, I really I thought they were very compelling about looking at our outcomes, being impressed by what's been done so far, and then thinking about how do we keep moving towards that horizon of, of ultimate academic impact and also uh, personal impact as well. So it's around 11.03, and you know, we're a large group. And so what I was thinking was, we actually have time, so we're going to do a bit of an experiment. And uh, my other job, I had up faculty development for UNMC. So I'm a big, big believer in, in active learning. And what, what we're going to do is we're going to take five minutes at each of your tables. And I want you to nominate one speaker, shockingly enough. You won't all have to share, but we'll, we'll look for probably five folks to come. And I want you to think about and discuss what you just heard on this panel and what you heard from our keynote as well. Take five minutes and think about what's the main thing that struck you. And if you have a question, you can also frame that. Okay? So we'll take about five minutes, uh, five to ten minutes. We'll say around 11.15, uh, we'll bring you guys back together. For the bold souls that are your speakers, we'll bring you guys up here to kind of share. So take those ten minutes and, and we'll bring you back. I'm Mandy Farwell and I work for Millard Public Schools. I'm one of the school social workers in the district. And as a table, we talked about how much we appreciate the panel um, kind of sharing their stories. And we were really, you know, excited about the opportunities um, that you had, Darius, about, you know, promoting kind of a grassroots opportunity for your region as far as mental health services. Um, because what we notice, as well as in our districts, that teachers are the front line and they do a great job. They have the rapport with students. Kids feel comfortable with them, so giving them opportunities to learn and grow because it is a frontline opportunity. Great. So really the comment is that teachers are frontline providers, and anyone want to comment on that from the panel? I know that several of you guys made a similar point. So Yeah, yeah for teachers being frontline, I, oh, sorry. teachers being frontline, uh, <clears throat> definitely, and me talking with the teachers in my area now, very few, like maybe 5% of teachers would know who to send parents to with the different issues. So, so our teachers, as wonderful as they are and all the great work they do, are the people that are in contact with the student and in contact with the parents all the time. So now if we get training to them, they will be that connection to the provider and it will naturally happen. Our, our providers, when I talk with them, are wondering what happens next. You know, it's gonna work that we're gonna work with schools, but how do we get down to the student level? And I think it'll naturally happen is that that teacher is the biggest connection to that parent. Yes. Yeah. A round of applause for Mandy for being a bold first speaker, so thank you. All right, another table, who, who has, yes, over here. Um, Jill's going to hustle on over, so. And again, just say who you are, what you represent, and with the main point at your table. And if there's a question, feel free to ask any of the panelists. Sure. This, my name's Elena Shriver, and I'm the refugee specialist for Omaha Public Schools. So one thing we noticed is it, it, there is a lot of support services in place for the English speakers. So within OPS, we have 112 primary languages spoken in the home, and over 2,000 students are refugees from war-torn countries who've obviously experienced trauma before, during, and after resettlement. They are lucky because they come legally so I can get Medicaid for them, but for our undocumented students, we don't have any funding for them at all, and they've also experienced very traumatic resettlement um, processes as well. So our question is, we've got a couple of questions. One, what efforts are being made to support those other languages if they're non-English speakers? Two, on the list of trainings for the teachers, we didn't notice anything about cultural competency or um, trauma-informed care for those people coming from different cultures who may have no concept of mental health or a very drastically different concept of mental health. And then third, what can we do for those undocumented kids who might even be living with strangers who are also undocumented and not necessarily invested in their care and treatment? How do we get funding? How do we get services for these students? Um, so, so really an outstanding question really about this whole increasingly diverse population we serve 
and what are the services that are available? Have you guys embraced this or come across this question? So yeah, that's a great question, actually. <clears throat> if if anybody has a, a bilingual therapist, send them our way. That'd be great. But um, we, we have tried for 20 years to have bilingual therapists. But uh, in the meantime, we we've, we've uh, just implemented a great uh, program through Method Cell System, Marty Interpreter System. So we've been using that, and it's been working great. So uh, we've been the, the two languages we primarily have used has been Spanish and Korean. And so uh, it's uh, at our main location, it's a video uh, um, interpreter service. And, but at our uh, other locations, it's a conference call, if you will. But it's got hundreds of different language interpretation. And so uh, it, it would fit along the line of what you're talking about. We've, uh, uh, we've used that this past school year, and it's been working really well. So um, that's where we're at with the... And, and, it's not the complete answer, but it's a, it's a great short term to, to deal with uh, the interpreter issues that we, we have in our offices right now. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that, that answers, I think, part of your question. So, mm -hmm. we've been very happy. And, and Methodist Health, that's one of those, those in kind services that Methodist Health System is providing and helping us to provide the services in, in the schools and the community offices. Mm -hmm. So, it's got like three, four hundred different languages that, that are available to us in our, in our, in our sites. And I'll, I'll comment as well, Lena. You know, I think you know, Beacons. Our, our job is to try to recruit the future providers of mental health that we need for the state. But I would say it's a, a huge challenge for us to find providers that are culturally or linguistically competent yeah. in all these different uh, languages and different communities. And and we don't have some easy solution to that. Uh, we are starting some of our pipeline programs to uh, Latino students, African American students, and that's that's occurred in the last year or two, you know, and there's been some work on Native American populations as well to see whether we can create some sort of bridging uh, program in concert with Monroe Meyer Institute. Um, but I would say we don't have an easy answer to this, and it really is going to reflect the needs for us to have more conferences looking at diverse providers. And, you know, one of the things that uh, Dr. Steven mentioned is that, you know, she would love to have a national conference here someday. But, you know, here locally, you know, Beacon is committed to, to making this a, a conference that would go on for at least the next two to three years, and, and really for us to embrace some of these future topics as well. And I think it'd be a great session next year to really look at some best practices in increasing diversity of our workforce. So thank you very much for that comment. Um, how about another, another question or response? Uh, Brent, you're signaling to somebody over here. And please stand up and say who you are and your question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Bond with the Nebraska Family Helpline at Boys Town. Ours were more comments um, rather than questions, but a couple things we really appreciated were the discussion about using intentional language. So um, talking about nominating kids and identifying kids as opposed to discipline referrals. I think language does make a big difference. That's something that we noted. So we also appreciated in the second uh, panelist when you talked about the surveys that teachers filled out and their acknowledgement of their lack of empathy. So we would love to dig in more in that and just learn more about, um, it, we appreciate their honesty, first of all, but more about is it because their classes are too big? Is it because of some of the specific behaviors are taking over time for um, you know other things? We know that teachers don't go into teaching because they have a lack of empathy. So what's causing that? What, what's happening there? Um, and then we also just love that you talked about in our keynote speaker that she talked about the uh, acknowledgement of the kids that have the internalized behaviors. I think so often it mm -hmm. really focuses on the behavioral problems in the mm -hmm. classroom and um, how do we help those potentially ADHD kids that are not paying attention, not focusing, all, kind of all over the place um, and really spending some more time looking at those kids and helping those kids that don't show the specific behaviors. So more comments really and thank you for the opportunity here to talk about these things. Wonderful. And, and by the way, while you're standing up, Katie, do you want to say a little bit about what your group does? <clears throat> well, thank you. <laughs> we are a 24-7 crisis line for parents that have any behavioral health concerns, mental health concerns. Um, we spend a lot of time doing crisis de-escalation on the phone, so we are not licensed mental health practitioners on the phone. We're trained crisis counselors, so we do a lot of referring to the agencies and the folks in this room, and we know that a lot of times schools are the first places that... Um, are identifying these concerns. So we're a crisis line, like I said, for any parent, any third party professional, anyone really in the state of Nebraska to call and just talk with someone. Um, sometimes parents just need someone to talk to at 11 o'clock at night, so we can do that as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fantastic. 
So, um, you know, a great comment and uh, on the whole internalizing, externalizing, you know, I, uh, when we train our medical students, I often tell them that populations often missed are the kids that are staring out the window for ADHD, right? They're quietly in the back, not doing well, they're kind of skating by or almost failing, but they're not causing a lot of problems, you know, and so they get missed until they're, you know, middle school or sometimes high school and that kind of thing. And so I think it is something to be very mindful of and making sure that you have a wide catchment as you're designing your screening and assessment, right? Any other comments from the group on that one? Okay. Uh, any other, another table? Yes, here, um, someone uh, here in the middle. Oh, wait, Brent, did you have one? <clears throat> I'm Lou Cox Fornander from Ogallala, Nebraska, um, ESU 16. Um, that's quite a ways away. And so Welcome. Thanks for driving out here. Yeah. The, uh, round of applause. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, which just kind of lets you know that obviously mental health is um, a statewide concern, not just in the metro areas, but we in the rural places really um, sometimes struggle with um, actually a lot of the same things that y'all do. But what our table talked about was that there is hope and we were kind of um, excited about the hope for like a, maybe even a statewide mental health model um, and the chance to provide um, partnerships with multiple agencies to really look at that um, within whatever, wherever you are. And to deal with not just the student's mental health, but also the mental health can feed into that academic piece and so to look at the um, students as a whole. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe one of our biggest questions was how do we get um, administrators on board with the importance of this, not just focusing on the academic achievement. So how can we um, get school administrators and everybody on board to really help us provide and see the importance of um, mental health in schools? Yeah, so uh, you know, thanks so much, and it really is a statewide issue, and we really wanna make sure that these resources and, and opportunities are disseminated across the state. Uh, and the question is on administrators. Do you guys want to talk about your experience talking to principals or superintendents and other senior folks, uh, uh, SPED directors and so on? And, and you are one there, so you know, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you guys think? <clears throat> yep, I can go, I guess. Um, I think moving forward and the training, I think the student, but having the student issue at the district so you can discuss that. Um, kind of hard just to talk about it and say you need to have empathy for this child. If the child's in front of you and they're going through the things, I think it will help a lot. But I, there is nothing better than us getting the behavioral health providers into the school districts because it has not happened. So it, it isn't surprising that our districts aren't dealing with it better than they are because they haven't had it up to this point. Um, I think it will all come, uh, like I think the gal in the back said, or somebody said, teachers don't go, are, are in the profession because they do have a heart, because they do have empathy, compassion. It is a big confusion thing when a kid is a very smart kid and they're having problems. That is the biggest issue I see. The, when I have fight back from either teachers or from, it's all over the fact that the kid has the ability to do it. They can't understand the mental illness and because they were a straight A student in the past and they've never done anything wrong, why in the world are they acting this way now? And it's always back to that punishment model. If we take something away from them, then they'll start acting better. But as we know, with mental health, it isn't gonna happen that way. So I think training, number one. So I just had a couple of remarks. Uh, that's a question we get asked quite often is how can we sell this essentially to school administrators and one of the things that we did along with the school-based health alliance uh, a couple of years ago with some funding from the CDC we had uh, the opportunity to develop school mental health capacity building for state and local levels. We developed some uh, self-facilitated guides that can help states and districts do this work. And one of the modules that was developed was marketing school mental health for school administrators. And so uh, if you go to our website, you should be able to find it. Or if you Google that, I can also send it out as a resource afterwards. But essentially, it's exactly what you're talking about, which is how can you uh, get across the message that mental health is linked to academic and student success. Part of it is just getting that message down, getting that broad message down to some key talking points. We do have an impact document on our website that in bullet points talks about the link between mental health and academics. And then just how do you make
make that ask of your administrator. As a real quick piggyback to one of the questions over here about uh, students who've immigrated and how can we support um, youth who've been exposed to trauma through that process. If you're unfamiliar with the resource, uh, traumaawareschools.org, it's the site of one of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network sites that's devoted specifically to how schools can support trauma-exposed youth, and they've done a lot of work with students uh, who've been exposed to trauma as part of uh, the immigration process. So that's trauma-aware schools. And I, I think we have time for about one more question or comment. So, oh, Brent, did you have one? <clears throat> Hello. My name is uh, Gloria Gonzalez Kruger. I'm the Behavioral Health Director of, at One World and uh, Federally Qualified Health Center. And uh, we were talking about the fact that there is too much to do in a classroom. Uh, someone was talking about a poster of what teachers did back in the 1920s and uh, compared to what they are doing today. And that's a huge, significant uh, difference. The other thing we talked about was confidentiality. If we're going to integrate or if we're going to create collaboratives or partnerships between mental health and education, one of the key issues is confidentiality. Right now, confidentiality between mental health and education educators, uh, is, it, there is no best practices, there is no model that right now that uh, appropriately deals with that. How much can we partner, how much can we share? Um, I think that that would certainly address the issue of empathy by teachers, uh, because I know that very often they feel closed out of the mental health system. We start taking the kids, but they, they play a role in kind of our treatment plan, but they really have little to no information due to confidentiality issues. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Gloria. And uh, so I guess this final question and comment is really about confidentiality, and they're not technically part of the parental or the family guardian unit, and how to they feel sometimes left out when they are seeing a community provider. How do you bridge that gap? And, and of course, teachers are doing more and more compared to uh, a century ago. So what are your thoughts? Uh, well, it, well, it varies, but uh, let me see here. Um, I, well, I try to sell it to the parent. To me, again, coming from the systems perspective, I always try to you know, help the parents understand that the, um, it's important for uh, the teachers to be involved. I think it was it was mentioned earlier that if the the, the teacher is involved in the child's life, you know, six eight hours of the day, you know, they're they're part of this. They need to know what's going on basically. So what I try to do is get the parents to sign the consent and let the um, me to visit with the, the teacher and I whatever I can share with them clinically um, that's relevant. Um, and when I'm not there, they, the teacher can help me to be there. I, they're the eyes and ears for me. Um, some parents don't sign, some parents do sign. So, I mean, it, it really just varies from parent to parent, teacher to teacher. Um, again, we keep in mind, you know, we're blending two confidential, uh, we're HIP, HIPAA and FERPA. So, it, it's just a, it's a dance um, working with the school districts and uh, um, with, uh, you know, confidentiality. Um, in working with elementary, middle, and high school, um, you know, we want to let them know that we're only going to share what we need to share. I mean, it, it's just a, it, it really is just a uh, difficult time uh, in, in wanting to, uh, I don't know, you have anything to share? I'm just kind of. Um, yeah, you know, in I, fact, um, I was at a, a conference the beginning part of this week, and that was one of the issues discussed. How, when, um, when a clinician or, say, um, school counselors, when, when there is a problem, how do you, how can you make that conversation with the parent without bringing confidentiality, or how can you bring everybody together on it? And it really comes to understanding HIPAA. And again, you know, back on the legislative efforts, I, I know there's efforts being made, um, like with Caring Families Act. I can't remember, is it the Healthy Families, Healthy Caring Families, something along those lines um, that's trying to make it more possible, you know, with consent and everything that that information can be shared in that context, just in that context. But they are, it is being addressed, but it is very complex. It's, it's a difficult question to answer, and like you said, it is a dance to get around that, to open up that communication. Even though you do give consent, I don't share everything. So I mean, it's, you know, it, it, it's as needed and what the information is. So 
Um, and a lot of times, depending on the age of the child, I'll ask them, is it okay to share with the teacher? So, I mean, it, it's all, yeah, again, it's, it's, it's all a clinical need type of thing. And so, I'll, again, sometimes I'll clear it with the, the parent or I'll ask the parent if in this situation is okay to talk to the student. It, dip, just, it, it just really depends on the case by case, situation by situation need. Um, and a lot of times teachers are willing to share you anything. You don't even have to say anything. You just show up and they'll tell you everything there is to know about the kids. So, and so then it's us reminding them that, hey, you shouldn't be sharing this with me. So, it's, uh, um, so it, it really is uh, us educating them a lot of times about the rules and, and regulations on, on confidentiality. So, um, One more thing I just want to add to that. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons why having a, a policy is so um, yeah. important kind of have that chain of command how you make the referrals so it goes to the right people and then those right people are making the right discussions. But another important reason to have a policy in place. So, so that's all set out beforehand. And then with our, our consent, and I, it, it, they can specify specific individuals that they want us to talk to. So it's not just an open, you know, you know, you know carte blanche kind of a thing. We can talk to anybody and everybody. They say, okay, we want you to only talk to certain people in that school. So. Um, so they can uh, they can be very specific on who we talk to, and so and sometimes that and that to me it's it's always been about really just talking and just communication with that parent and letting them know you know it's very important for me to be able to talk with with individuals in that school you know for the reasons I said earlier it's they're my eyes and ears for that student for their their son or daughter. Well. I'd like to all of us give a round of applause to our outstanding panelists. <clears throat> and also to Dr. Stephen for outstanding comments as well. So, and I want to thank all of you for being so, so interactive, you know, and, uh, and really having such thoughtful questions. And it really will give us grist for our future conferences to think about answering some of these questions and bringing some of these resources to you. So really it was a delightful discussion.